Okay, I'd like us, please, if we could, to turn uh, in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 9 once more. Revelation chapter 9, and I'm going to be reading from verse 13, uh, looking at this sixth angel blowing the trumpet. And we're going to uh, get a glimpse at the world's biggest army uh, today. So verse uh, 13 uh, of Revelation uh, chapter 9, and it says this, And the sixth angel sounded... And I heard a voice uh, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. And again, God will bless that reading of this very sobering portion of the word of God. Uh, we began uh, list, last time looking a little bit at this uh, section, and we talked about these four angels. We kind of contrasted it with the four angels uh, in chapter 7 that held back the storm from coming until God's sealed ones could be sealed. Uh, and now we have another four angels, but they're contrasted with the first four angels. It would seem the first four angels in Revelation 7 were good angels, uh, what we call the elect angels. On the other hand, these angels were bound. Uh, we see that uh, in uh, verse 14, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates or at the great river Euphrates. And so there, there are angels that are bound. Usually when it talks about angels that are bound, uh, it talks about angels that had sinned more than just the initial rebellion. Uh, against God when a third of the angels fell, but had gone beyond that and had uh, been so wicked that they had been bound up. And these angels certainly have been bound up. And we learned it was for a certain time uh, when uh, prepared by God for them to be loosed. And as a result of that loosing, they were going to gather together an army. And so uh, they were bound. And when we, we read again, just the language in verse 15, uh, that they they were loose, which were prepared. And again, it's interesting that even though they're wicked angels, God is the one who is going to release them uh, from their their bound state, uh, and it's on His time schedule, not theirs. And so, it's they're prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And you get you sense this that God is in control even during this. This wicked time on the earth, nobody's going to do anything unless the Lord allows it, and, and it fits his time scale, not theirs. And so uh, we see something of his sovereign control. Now, we want to just focus our attention a little bit um, in verse 14 on this great river Euphrates. It says, uh, verse 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. 
Now, again, this Euphrates River, very interesting, very significant in terms of the Bible. Uh, it's uh, always been the eastern boundary. Uh, we said of both the land given to Abraham when he's given the land grant, the Euphrates River is the, the eastern boundary. Also, the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire never went beyond the Euphrates River. And so very much a dividing line between what we call the east and the west. The Euphrates uh, River actually originates in Turkey, high upon the slopes of Mount Ararat, where the Ark rested. And it flows through the land of Turkey, uh, through Syria and Iraq, to the Persian Gulf. Now, there's another river that kind of runs parallel. Uh, you've got, on the one hand, the Euphrates River, and then parallel to it, uh, there's another river called the Tigris River. It makes a parallel course for hundreds of miles or thousands of kilometers, and they run parallel together. And in between them, between these two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, is a land that we're so familiar with in Scripture. It's called the land of Mesopotamia. In fact, the land of Mesopotamia uh, literally means the land between two rivers and, of course, plays a very significant role in Scripture. And so this, this uh, Euphrates River on the east side uh, and so release the four angels. Again, we said the exact hour and the day. And again, we think of the book of Daniel. Uh, we, again, we think of how the timing of things, the first advent of Christ, Daniel chapter nine, uh, you know, 60, 70 weeks are determined for your people. Uh, 69 of them have already come. There's this final 70th week. And again, it's all in the, the timing of God. It's all in his control. And I just want you just to sense that, that everything's under his control. Because even now, as we look at our world, it's very easy for us as Christians. And I just, we talked about this at our prayer meeting on Wednesday night, uh, for Christians to uh, become distressed uh, because of what we see happening all around us, uh, for us to become anxious uh, what we see around us, because we're seeing our civilization imploding, basically, and we have not witnessed this before, and it's it's it can be very intimidating, but we've got to keep remembering that everything is under the hand and control of God, that he is still on the throne, and uh, have that the peace of knowing that he's in control of all these things, allowing these things. And so the release of these four angels is exactly on the hour, the day, uh, in keeping with uh, his uh, is his timing. Now, we want to notice, too, that this army is an army of 200 million in number, which is mustered. Again, we see that in verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And this is kind of quite significant because notice he says the number of the horsemen. And so he's only talking about cavalry here. There's no in infantry. This is this is a cavalry of 200 million men, which is sig very significant. Um, and the result of this, this army and their being mustered together uh, to do their work is that a third part of men will be killed by this army. And again, we saw that in verse 16, 15, for, uh, they've been prepared for to slay the third part of men and again we see it in verse 18 by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths so again let's just kind of put that into perspective currently we're saying the world population is eight billion the first half of the tribulation period um, already a fourth part of men died. So that's reduced the world population to 6 billion. So we've gone from eight to six. But now, as a result of another third part of men being slain, so uh, again, if you take a third of 6 billion, it takes us to 4 billion. And so now the world population, by the time we get into the second half of the tribulation period and the releasing of the sixth trumpet, and again, remember, when the seventh trumpet sounds, now we've got, then we've got seven more judgments to come. So, so already at this hour, you have an amazing thing. The world population has been decimated 
by 50%. Four billion left out of eight. That's, that's staggering. That's one in two. Every second person on planet Earth is dead. Never since the days of Noah has such a large percentage of the population come under God's righteous judgment. Because remember, this, is, this all begins with the lamb opening the first seal. So this is definitely a time of uh, God's judgment on the human race. And so uh, staggering reduction of the world population by 50%. Also notice um, this this army. The, I guess the big question that comes uh, when you read a passage like this is the identity of the horsemen. Are they a human army or are they another demonic army? Remember the first part of this chapter, we've got two invasions and we had this invasion of these demon locusts that uh, were given to uh, hurt men for five months. But now we, we have another army of 200 million men. And so the big question is, are they demonic uh, like the demon locusts or is it uh, an army of men? And uh, one of the things that's interesting is that because this is the sixth trumpet that's sounding, we do know that in the Bible, six is a significant number. It's the number of man presenting the full glory of man. <laughs> and, and so uh, perhaps that's a hint towards the identity of these riders. The general assumption is they come from the east of the Euphrates River, although it's not stated. They're, they're, the angels are bound up in the Euphrates, but it would seem that that's a, a very logical inference. They come from east, the east of the Euphrates River. We're not told where they end either. We're not told the direction they go in. We're not told any details really as to what actually happens other than that their activity results in a third part of mankind being slain. Uh, often the, the inference is made that this is the same uh, group that you see in Revelation 16. And I want us to go to Revelation 16. Uh, just for a moment, and verse 12. And again, we have another sixth angel um, pouring out in verse 12 of Revelation 16. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw these unclean spirits, so on and so forth. And of course, they're being brought um, to the... They're being brought to the Battle of Armageddon. And so the, the inference is that that's what's in view here. This is the army from the east that is coming uh, towards <clears throat> Armageddon. But again, it's just an inference. Uh, and again, it could, could it be that there are two distinct things, that th there's this event here at the seventh trumpet, and there's a, a further event uh, at the seven bowl judgments, because these are in sequence. And so could it be that the, the mustering of this army will result in a third part of men being killed, even though the official campaign does not begin until we get to chapter 16? If it is a human army, and that would be my conviction that it's a human army here, it hasn't kind of given us the clue that it's demonic in any way. It is a, a marvelous, mighty army. Um, mir mir militarily, uh, it certainly will be irresistible because it is supernaturally aided. It's it's brought about by these demonic uh, creatures, the four angels that are that are behind it, that are that are unleashing it. But just to put it in perspective, uh, a human army of this size has never been seen in history. Mind you, having said that, the world population has never been a billion in history either. So, um, but there's never been seen. In fact, the, the total size of all the armies on both the Allies and Axis side during the height of the Second World War was only 70 million. 
So think about that. There were 70 million active servicemen during the Second World War on all sides. And now we're talking of an army of 200 million men. Back in 1965, China made the claim that they had an army and a militia of 200 million men. That was back in 1965. So it's possible, very definitely possible, that an army from the East of 200 million men could indeed be mustered. Notice verse 17 now back in our passage in chapter 9, verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Well, now we have a difficulty. Uh, John describes the horses, and they're not your typical horses, possessing lion's head, which at least it gives us a picture. They in indicate the fierceness and destructive nature of them. Uh, these this this uh, this uh, cavalry. Uh, also, the breastplates uh, suggest invulnerability to human destruction. They're strong. They're powerful. They have these breastplates, and of course, they're described. Uh, and then we learn too that out of their mouths come of the lions come fire, smoke, and brimstone come out of the horses' mouths. And again picturing the utter destructive nature of their attacks against people. The locusts in, in the previous section in verse 10, uh, they could only hurt men uh, for five months, but these creatures are now allowed to destroy men, to kill men, uh, a third of mankind. Now, there is a thought that when it talks about the breastplates, uh, for instance, uh, it, it talks about ha having breastplates of fire, and then it says, and of jacinth and brimstone. So there's two ways you can look at that, that they're kind of all a mixture of these things, or that there are some that have breastplates of fire, uh, some of jacinth, some of brimstone. And the implication being that, and, and many believe this, that it's showing that this, this army is a coalition and they're, they're, they're definite, the breastplates indicate the different ranks of the army, different uh, groups of the army that will be there together, uh, distinguishing the identity, if you like, of, of the different nations contributing to this invading army. The horse's uh, description would indicate uh, perhaps that John is describing more modern forms of warfare Technology unknown to John, uh, but described in terms familiar to him, uh, we could call them perhaps mechanical horses. It would seem that they have some mechanical nature because of the ability for fire and brimstone, unless they're demonic. And, and so certainly uh, that's a, a strong possibility. And so we read uh, about this army and these, uh, these horses and, and of course, it's the horses that are doing the destruction. It says, by these three, verse 18, was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. And so this is the means of the destruction. And again, we think of this, a third part of men. Uh, and again, we're talking here, two billion souls. Two billion souls destroyed by this army of 200 million men. And of course, by the, the power in these horses. And notice uh, in verse 19, it says, their power is in their mouth and in their tails, but their tails were like unto serpents and in heads, and with them they do hurt. And so both the front and the back of these mechanical horses or whatever, uh, have the ability to, to do hurt, to do much damage. And then verse 20, and this is, this is perhaps the most shocking part of all this, never mind the army of 200 million men, never mind all the rest of it. This to me is the most shocking of it all. It says, the rest of the men, 
which were not killed. So now we're talking about the survivors, the, the 4 billion souls that are left, that they've so far evaded death. They, they've survived this far in the tribulation period. And yet we learn, it says, they were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor talk. And so what we find is um, it's, a, it's a little glimmer into the incredible hardness of the human heart that even though they've witnessed all this, they still refuse to repent. We also observe that in this time of the tribulation, religious deception and demon worship will reach an all-time high because this idolatry continues. And we know from elsewhere uh, in 1 Corinthians that behind these idols are none other than demons. And so uh, how did man respond to these judgments? Again, verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. And so uh, it's interesting, worship of the heart, which is directed still towards demons, is manifested in the life, right? In other words, what a man worships will result in uh, the kind of life that, that comes from that man. These are people are worshiping demons, and the result is given in verse 21. They don't repent of their murders, sorceries, fornications, their thefts. Uh, there's, there's a corresponding lifestyle uh, towards this demonic worship. And so how did they respond to these judgments so far? Just as under grace, generally, mankind have been hard-hearted, even under judgment divine wrath divine judgment man is just as hard-hearted just as pharaoh hardened his heart and and remember he he i mean he saw such ever even his own magicians had said to pharaoh this is the finger of god and yet uh, his heart remained hard let me just read from exodus 7 and verse 22 and remember we said a lot of these judgments they parallel uh, some of them parallel to us, the plagues of Egypt, and it's kind of the same the same story. Uh, man hasn't changed since the days of the Exodus. In Exodus 7.22, it says, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. <clears throat> and the Lord <clears throat> knew what was in the heart of man. And we see the same response here. They repented not. Neither, they didn't change their minds at all about God. And again, we see it in verse 21. And so what was the result of this demonic worship? How does it result? Uh, what's the outcome of it? Well, it says in verse 21, neither repented they of their murders. And so one of the things that we see is that they, they, they value the life of man very lightly. Uh, they take away the life of man. Uh, they, they don't value men. And you see, as our society becomes more pagan, it's incredible how our society values animals and bugs more than they do men. They can get all irate about the threat to the whale population and yet murder. And I, I told now that the 60 million babies that I'm talking about in the U.S. has now gone up to 73 million uh, and and do that w without batting an eyelid. In fact, thinking it's the right thing to do, and and so murder uh, still continues apace, uh, as well as all these other deaths. These idolaters are involved in murdering, and then sorceries. <clears throat> excuse me, sorceries, uh, the deceiving of man's minds. So if murders is taking away the life of man, uh, and sorcery, and again, this is demonic all the way through, isn't it? Deceiving of man's minds. And again, the word, by the way, there is the word pharmakia. And again, it's drugs that are used to affect the mind of man. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is rampant uh, during this time. And I, I do believe that our culture has become increasingly dependent on drugs. And I'm not just talking about uh, the 
uh, you know, illegal drugs, but I'm talking about our own medicine cabinets. We are, we are a pharmacia dependent culture, and some of it can have great effects on the mind. Uh, I just was uh, saw a report of another transgender person who committed a savage murder, and this is becoming an increasing thing. And and could it be that the 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 actual drugs that they have to take to change the hormonal makeup of them from what they were born to what they want to be has an effect on the mind. And, it, and, and some of them are going insane, doing absolutely the most insane things. And so again, this idea of the deceiving of man's mind by pharmacia, and certainly there are drugs that affect the mind greatly. Uh, you hear people <clears throat> on drugs and they, they'll, they'll, and I'm talking about prescription drugs, certain ones, and they hear voices. <laughs> Where does that come from? Uh, back in our new tribes days, uh, one of the tribes that was uh, particularly of, of interest was the Yanomami Indians uh, down in the uh, the Amazon jungle, and they would they would through their noses they would snort drugs to get involved with the spirit world, and and the ingestion of these drugs is is was the doorway to open the way to the demonic world. Uh, don't you think that in the 60s, the psychedelic 60s, uh, where all our society began to implode, that's where it really goes back to. When people came back from Vietnam, what did they bring with them? Drugs. I, I was talking to a guy who himself was saved out of a life of drugs, and he said his brother came back from Vietnam. And they'd never heard of drugs in their small town in the rural Midwest. And this guy came back and he brought and introduced drugs, and it changed the whole scene. And so, again, we have to recognize the dangers of pharmacia, of these sorceries, this witchcraft, because it does open the doorway. By the way, just an, an aside, but I, I saw a very interesting documentary of a guy who worked amongst the Anamami, a believer, a missionary. And one of the things that he said was um, somebody had sent his son, uh, you've heard of Pokemon, uh, sent his son a magazine with Pokemon. And they showed it to a guy who was the former uh, shaman in the tribe, who is now a believer, you know, one of the elders in the assembly, a firm, former shaman. And when he saw the Pokemon, he recognized them all. And he said, these are the introductory demons that we, we start out with. These are the ones that bring us in <laughs> into the spirit world in our Pokemon games. Let me tell you, folks. This is this is real today. This the, the 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 demonic world are out there, coming after our children uh, through uh, all of these uh, kind of things that have been introduced. And and but amazing, this guy recognized all of them. Fornication, uh, along with uh, this this addiction to uh, pharmacia, murder, their their fornications, debasing of man's body and his dignity with sexual immorality in its widest aspect. And again, we see some of these things already in our own culture. By the way, along with that fornication comes the murders, because along with that lifestyle comes unwanted children. And to, in other words, not to cramp our style, we just put them to death. We offer them to Moloch. And so uh, fornications and then thefts, taking away of man's possessions. And so you can see that all of these things are robbing man, uh, <clears throat> taking away the life of man, murder, <clears throat> deceiving the mind of man, this, um, the drugs uh, and sorceries, fornication, debasing of man's body and his dignity, and thefts, taking away man's possessions. And let me just say, I'm going to just do a little aside here before we jump into chapter 10. But I've just been thinking a lot recently. In fact, I'm going to be speaking about it this weekend about the ugliness of sin and the beauty of holiness. And it, it just really comes out. This, this is a description of unrepentant people and what it looks like. And it's everything's about debasing man. Man who was made in the image and likeness of God, descending into this kind of conduct. And somehow I think we've lost the 
ugliness of sin. That's part of the deception, the deceitfulness of sin. Satan tries to make it look appealing and attractive, but it's really ugly. And when God describes it, and I was thinking of Isaiah chapter one, when he describes the sinfulness of Israel in their rebellion and their idolatry in Isaiah chapter one, he talks about from the sole of the foot to the top of the head being covered in putrefying sores. What a, what a, and of course, le leprosy as well. You see that when, when uh, something on the inside, disease on the inside breaks out on the outside, you get leprosy. And so it always presents sin in this ugly idea. And so you see somebody and imagine that, you know, that right now I'm covered in putrefying sores and I got pus coming out of them and all. It, it's not a pretty picture. And that's the picture that God presents of sin. It's deforming, it's, it mars the man who is made in the image and likeness of God. It is absolutely ugly. And on the other hand, God talks about the beauty of holiness, the dignity of it all. And so, brethren, we, we need to preach <laughs> the exceeding sinfulness of sin and, and the reality of it, how ugly and deforming it is, and at the same time, encourage the beauty of holiness as seen in our beautiful savior the holiest man that ever walked this earth oh how beautiful he is and so just just to throw that out there we see here man unrepentant still worshiping and of course don't forget going to culminate all this demon worship in the worship of satan himself in this this beast uh, that is going to be an image of the beast is going to be made and all the world is going to be compelled to worship. And of course, that's what the demonic world has always longed for, the worship that is due to God alone. And so this is where we're headed. This is the climax that we're headed towards. Now we come to chapter 10. And we want to uh, consider what we call the second parenthesis. The first parenthesis, which we looked at, uh, was in chapter 7. Yeah, chronologically, as we went through, uh, we saw this where he kind of stops the flow and, and wants to look at something. And so, of course, it's in chapter seven, it's answering the question, who will be able to stand? And, and God talks about the people who will survive the tribulation period. And so he kind of stops the action. We want to look at the people. When we get to chapter 10, this parenthesis begins in chapter 10, is going to go all the way through to chapter 11, verse 13. So let me show you how we know this is a parenthesis, because uh, remember, we've just had, we've been looking at the sixth angel blowing his trumpet in verse 14. And now we have to wait till we get to chapter 11, verse 14, where it says, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And so the, 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 there's a, a break uh, in the action between the sixth trumpet sounding and the seventh trumpet sounding. And we're looking at another parenthetical portion. So if the first parenthesis, we were, we were kind of looking at the people, this parenthesis, now we want to look at the places of the tribulation period. We're asking the question, who's going to be saved? Is anybody going to survive this? And we saw that in chapter 7. Now we want to look at the specific places that are in view. Chapter 10 is going to deal with the earth in general and, and uh, the earth and the sea, because that's going to be the scene of much of this devastation. So we're going to see uh, the creation in general, if you like, uh, the places, uh, the creation in general. And then in chapter 11, we're going to look at the city in particular. And we're going to be looking particularly at Jerusalem and what that city is going to be like during the tribulation period and what we might learn from it. And so the creation and the city under the big title of the, the, the places. I want to look at the places, creation in general, the whole world, and then focusing on the city, the center of God's purposes for the earth is in Jerusalem. And so we're going to be having a close look at that. 
There is a, a third parenthesis, I'll just mention that. It's a very short one in chapter 16 and verse 15, where he says, uh, interrupting the flow, he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And there, uh, it's not so much the people or the places, it's the person, the Lord Jesus. He is coming. <laughs> and uh, here it's the, the creation, it's the city. And then we're going to look specifically at the fact of the coming, the coming of the Lord Jesus. So the parenthesis is designed to show that God has never abandoned his purposes with regard to the earth. And that creation's groanings, which are groaning exceedingly at this time in the tribulation, are soon coming to an end. That's what chapter 10 is going to tell us. Actually, it's going to be claimed, the earth and the sea is going to be claimed for the Lord Jesus. He's, remember, he's got the title deed, and now we're going to see he's going to send an, a mighty angel who's going to claim it for him on the earth. That's kind of the theme here. Uh, that uh, that uh, this this planet that has been given to him to reign over, he is going to assert his claim to the planet uh, in this particular chapter. And the, so it's designed to show that God has never abandoned his purposes with regard to the earth and that creation's groanings are soon going to come to an end. Also, the assurance that everything happening on the earth is still under divine control. The next chapter, chapter 11, will show that in spite of the crucifixion of Christ, the most culpable of all crimes, God will never abandon the city of his own choice. He still has purposes for the city of Jerusalem. And also, it's going to affirm to us in chapter 11 that even in the darkest time, the second half of the tribulation period in human history, God will not leave himself without a witness. What a wonderful thing it is that God will never leave himself without a witness. He's still going to have witnesses in the tribulation period. So even though it's not part of the chronological sequence, its placement here when we're in the second half of the tribulation period, is very relevant. It's going to demonstrate that a faithful God will never abandon his covenant promises. A very necessary assurance as the earth reels under the trumpet and the bold judgments. And again, you can imagine if you're living on the earth at this time, just as in the first parenthesis, people are asking the question, Who's going to survive? Here, you'll be tempted to ask the question, is earth going to survive? All of these judgments being poured out. And here we have the assurance. Oh, yes, God is not finished with this earth yet. He still has a purpose for it. And so as we look at, uh, begin to look at chapter 10, um, several questions that we want to uh, grasp here or deal with is first of all the identity of this mighty angel. Notice it says in verse one, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was it were the sun and his feet were as pillars of fire. The majority of Bible commentators identify this angel as Christ himself. Based upon the similarities in verse 1 of the previous visions we have been given of the Lord Jesus. So let's just kind of trace them through. And so the first one is, this angel comes down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Well, if you remember back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, we saw, behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, all the kindred of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. And then the next thing, again, in this sequence, he says, and a rainbow was upon his head. Again, in chapter 10, verse 1. And so we go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 3, where we've already seen a rainbow mentioned. And it says, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, 
and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And so again, connected with the throne of God, face as it were as the sun. This is the next thing that it mentions in sequence. And so it says, uh, 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 clothed with a cloud, a rainbow upon his head, his face was it as it were the sun. And again, we look at Revelation 1 and verse 16 and the vision of Christ. And he said in his right hand, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So that sounds very familiar. The final one is chapter 10, verse 1, speaks of his feet as pillars of fire. And we saw again in Revelation 1, verse 15, it says, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So the, the general conclusion of Bible commentators is that this mighty angel is the Lord Jesus. Now, much as I love to see Christ in all the scriptures, I do not for one minute believe that they're correct in saying this mighty angel is the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to give you lots of reasons. We're going to have to be patient. We'll go through uh, of why I don't believe this is the Lord Jesus. But <clears throat> part of it is uh, this is the third time, well, the three times in the book where this term mighty angel is going to be used. Uh, we saw it in chapter 5, verse 2, Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? So that's the first mention of a mighty angel. The last mention is in chapter 18 and verse 21. 18 verse 21, where it says, and a mighty angel, that's the same word in Greek, it's the same word as a strong angel, took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So interesting that three times a strong or mighty angel is mentioned in the book. First time, seems to occur uh, at the commencement of the tribulation period. This middle one seems to be kind of in the middle of events. And then the final one is at the end of the tribulation period, indicating a sequence is in view and a certain symmetry of design is seen in the book. There's a theological difficulty with the angel being Christ. And that is this. That although in the Old Testament, the eternal son appears as the angel of the Lord on several occasions, known as a what we call a theophany or a Christophany, after the incarnation, any subsequent appearance of Christ is as a man. In fact, if you look back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, it says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle and i want to suggest to you that when the lord jesus took on humanity the additional nature of humanity uh, became a man that he will never that will never change he will always be in a human body uh, and I, I i believe that that is consistent throughout scripture that the the taking on of that there's a, what we say there's a man in the glory we really believe that that there's a, a man at god's right hand and he will never appear in any other form other than as the son of man and so angels th throughout the book are seen as ministers of divine purpose and everywhere they're seen as distinct from divine persons the similarities the mighty angel bears to Christ are that he is a direct delegate from the throne and is acting with divine mandate and carries symbolic investiture that displays his authority. In other words, he's showing I am coming representing 
the one who is on the throne, representing the lamb and his cause. And so he carries these symbolic investitures. Some suggest that this angel, this mighty angel, may even be Michael. And part of the reason is he's going to raise his right hand uh, in an oath in this in this chapter, chapter 10. And when we look back at Daniel uh, chapter um, 12, if we just want to go there just for a second, Daniel chapter 12, we will notice <clears throat> verse 1, it says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that is shall be found written in the book. And then verse 6 and 7 of chapter 12 of Daniel. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lives forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half, and when he shall have accompanied, accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And so some say, well, it's Michael the archangel. That's who this mighty angel is in chapter 10. Again, the difficulty with that is that Michael is actually mentioned in chapter 12 by name, uh, where uh, we, we read in chapter 12 and verse 7, it says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And so if this is intended to be Michael, if he's already used the name Michael in chapter 12, why would he not use the name Michael here? So to me, it just seems that it's just another mighty angel and again just to emphasize that the, the, i think the strength of this position when it says in verse one i saw another angel another mighty angel come down from heaven the word another there uh, is in greek there's two possibilities there's another of the same kind or another of the different kind and so it just is simply another of the same kind so this angel is another mighty angel of the same kind of the ones we've been talking about before, back in chapter five, another just like him. And we we want to just acknowledge this, that, that the Lord Jesus is not another of the same kind. <laughs> he is absolutely unique. There is no one, whether human or angelic, that can compare with him. He's absolutely unique. This is another of the same kind. And so it's not the same as the Lord Jesus, but another is the same kind of the angels that have gone before. And so uh, I think it's important for us to see grammatically that it can't be the Lord Jesus that's in view here. So this, this angel, four things we've said are said about him. Uh, it, he's clothed with a cloud. That's just simply telling us he's a heavenly messenger. Uh, he's, he's coming down on behalf of heaven. Again, we believe a literal cloud is in view, as we've seen throughout the book. And so he comes clothed with a cloud, uh, coming, as, he, as it were, with heavenly authority. That's the thought. He has a rainbow upon his head. Certainly a reference to the rainbow mentioned in chapter 4, and, and because it's the only one mentioned in the book. But remember we said that it was, it was reminding us that in the tribulation period, God has not broken his covenant with the earth. He had given her a bow in the cloud for a purpose, and that was that he wasn't going to destroy the earth again. And he's not going to do it. Yeah, and so it's, it's, a, it's a covenant promise. Uh, despite the shattering events of the tribulation period, uh, God still has a covenant blessing in view for planet Earth. And it's recalling us the promises of God concerning that. The face, as it were, is the sun. 
Again, the angel is invested with divine glory for the, for the execution of his miss, mission. And again, the idea is this. When Moses came down, remember, he had that reflected glory. His countenance shone. And so I, I believe that's the idea. He's invested with these, come from the very presence of God, invested with divine glory for the, for the execution of his mission. In this dark scene of the last days of the tribulation period, this angelic messenger is bringing a radiance of hope from heaven. Then his feet as filth pillars of fire. God is still dealing in judgment with divine holiness demanding it. And each step reveals the crushing judgment of God. Uh, <clears throat> but again, it's tempered by his covenant promises. And so we notice in verse two, he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. I want to think about the angel stance. One foot on the sea, one foot on the land, indicating that both these spheres will be affected by his mission. As the agent of the throne, he is claiming possession for the throne. He is acting on behalf of the legal owner. Remember, Christ has now got the scroll. And so he's he's basically laying claim to this planet on behalf of the one who sits on the throne. Remember the book of Joshua? Remember when they were going in the land, it says, every place where the sole of your foot shall tread, it shall be yours. And now the angel representing the divine throne says, the sea and the land is going to belong to the lord jesus christ it's going to be his his by divine sovereign right he has now got the title deeds and he's claiming that well we're going to have to wait to think more about the little book in his hand <laughs> uh, this is a good moment to stop before we go into that because there were several observations we want to make about the little book but just good to remind ourselves that although there's a lot of groaning still for creation. God hasn't finished with this planet. And he is sending this delegate from the throne here in chapter 10 to claim it for the Lord Jesus. He's already got the scroll. Now a claim is being made that the earth and the sea belong to him. And he wants it back. And he's coming to take it back. And it's going to be his and oh, how we long for that day when the earth will be under the dominion of the, the man of God's appointment, the one who alone can properly manage earth's affairs, the more perfect form of government. May God encourage us with the expectation that that is coming soon. Amen.